interesting with all of those unexpected things that, are, that go on. What happens in our lives when things don't go as expected? You know, I don't know about your guys' lives. What happens in my life when things don't go as I expect it to go? Sometimes I can get frustrated. I can get upset. I can get angry. Um, then there's times where I follow the Lord and, and maybe it doesn't happen how God doesn't do what I think he should do, right? He's not doing the way I would have done it. And usually these times happen after great victories. There's usually some great victory and we're on this mountaintop experience and all of a sudden the circumstance happens and now we're into some despair and trial that's going on. You know, Daniel's testimony in Nepal really impacted my life. I shared it with the men where he said he just identifies with the disciples of Jesus Christ. That they were there and they saw God feed the 5,000. I mean, right there in, in Matthew 14, he's feeding the 5,000. What are we going to do while he's praying and breaking the, and the fish and, the, and he's fed these 5,000? And then in the very next chapter, Daniel was talking about it and he said, the very next chapter, the disciples are there and there's the 4,000. And they're not even remembering just what happened one chapter ago. That God showed up in a mighty way and did something amazing. And so they come with the same questions. What are we going to do? And God feeds the 4,000. The disciples didn't know what to do in the first instance. In the second instance, they didn't trust God. In the second instance, that he was going to continue to work and do something amazing. And Daniel just reminded me very personally that, because I've seen this too, that the Lord works in an amazing way in Nepal. He does amazing things. And then when we get back to Hawaii, somehow we don't expect the Lord to do the same thing here that he's done over there. But I always have to remember, and I was so encouraged with that, that God has a plan. That God has a plan, God has a timeline, He's moving His plan and His timeline forward. And it might not look how I expect it to look. There might be trials and discouragements along the way. But His plan is good. And He's going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think and everything that's going on. And this is exactly what we're going to see as we get into God's Word today. That God has a plan. And even when doors close, even when things don't go how we think they should go, the results aren't what we expect the results should be or think the results should be. We must remain true and obedient to God. We must remain true and obedient to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You guys all know this verse, Bible scholars, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And I got to talk about that with, to the men last night, that God is looking at the inward, and so often we look at the outward, but God wants us to walk by faith. I mean, in, we've just seen, uh, excuse me, in Acts chapter 15, the church has had a major victory. The gospel has been secured. There has to be nothing that needs to be added to the cross of Jesus Christ. The leadership of the church, if you notice that, remember we talked about it, the leadership and the church are in complete unity together going out into this world to preach what's, what Jesus did on the cross. They have love for their brothers, leaving behind those things that are going to cause their brothers to stumble. The church is being built up, strengthened, and encouraged. Everything is going amazing. So turn with me in your Bibles this morning. Acts chapter 15. We're starting there in verse 36. Did I... Can you switch me to number one? Acts chapter 15, verse 36. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. And Acts chapter 15, 36 says this. And after some days... After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Paul has this amazing idea. We have this great encouraging letter from the leadership of the church. We're in unity. Let's go back to all of those places that we visited. Let's go back to all of those churches in Galatia I mean, this letter has brought joy and strength in the church in Antioch. Let's go back because the Lord wants to do the same thing in those places that we have just come from. Let's take a second missionary journey, although I'm pretty sure they didn't call it back then, a second missionary journey. That's what we call it now. Let's take it a second missionary journey. And this is an amazing idea. Let's go back and build up these church, sharing with these Gentile believers that the church leadership is in unity. And this is what they're to do. 
There needs to be nothing added to the cross. They don't need to follow the law and be circumcised. That they can follow Jesus Christ. That they're saved. Let's take this back. And Barnabas agrees. This is an amazing idea. Verse 37. Now Barnabas. That's a great idea. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take uh, not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Bamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Super, super interesting right here. I love this idea, but Barnabas says, let's take my cousin. I have, I have my cousin here. And Paul says, hey, brother, your cousin deserted us. Let's just, let's just be honest about what just happened not too long ago. This guy deserted us when we needed him for the work, and he made it hard for this mission team. Barnabas responds, yeah, you know, he did desert us, but God is working in this guy. God's doing something great in John Mark. He's older, he's more mature now, whatever the case, you know, he's making his plea to Paul. See, here's the thing. Barnabas is true to his name. He's a son of what? Encouragement. He wants to encourage and build up this young man, John Mark. I got to talk about it with the young adults. We, had a, we started our young adult study last Sunday, and I got to talk about this very thing, this encouragement with the young adults. The pastor in the message that we were listening said, you know, there's times where the enemy wants to say, this is who you are. This is the person you are. But God says this, I know what you did. I know what you did. God knows every single thing that you have done, that I have done, that each and every one of us has done. I know what you have done, but that's not who you are. This is the encouragement that God gives to each one of us. He knows that we're sinners. He knows that we fall short. But that's not who we are because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I know that John Mark deserted the team. I know that that label can be put on him. But that's not who he is. He's a child of God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can overcome. This is what Barnabas is pleading to Paul about. Let's encourage this young man. We need to give him a second chance to build up his faith. Barnabas has a great point. This is something for me today. That I, I need to be encouraged in my own walk. Because God knows all of the failures in my own life. God sees the failures that happen that you guys don't get to see. He sees the failures in my home. He sees the times where I'm not the spouse that I need to be. He sees the times where I'm not that parent that I need to be. He sees the failures in times with my neighbors and friends. I'm not witnessing as effectively as I need to witness. He knows those failures. He knows what I did, but he always encourages me. That's not who you are. Anymore. You're a child of the Most High God. You're my, you're my kid. I mean, here the enemy has tried to give John Mark this label of failure. You're a failure. You're a deserter. That is who you are. But the power of God in his life helps him to overcome these labels that the enemy is trying to give him. And man... He remembers this. I'm a child of God. But Paul, on the other hand, this guy Paul, he sits there and says, you know what? That might be true, Barnabas, but this guy left us. The work was before us. He, brought, he made a commitment to come and do the work. He made a commitment to the Lord, and he abandoned that commitment. Barnabas, he abandoned it. I don't want to take this missionary journey. It's going to be much more difficult than our, than our one we just got done with. I need somebody who's going to be steadfast, who's proven. I know I'm not willing to expose the rest of the team to someone who's wishy-washy. Paul has a good point. I go to Nepal every year. It's my seventh year. If I know somebody is wishy-washy, it's going to be very difficult for me to say, let me bring that guy back again this year just to see if he's changed. I don't want to see if somebody's changed on the mission field. I want to see if somebody's changed in church before I would take them back again on the field. So I understand Paul's point. I don't want to take somebody who's been unproven and untrustworthy. And so Paul has a great point. Now we have two, I mean, these are the two head pastors of the church of Antioch. And so you know what two head pastors are going to do. They've worked together for so long, pastoring this church, doing mission work together, standing for the truth of the gospel in Jerusalem. They're going to pray through this disagreement, seeking the Lord's will, coming to an agreement together. It's exactly what's going to happen, right? Because that's what we would expect to happen in a church. Verse 39. 
And there arose a prayer meeting and an agreement. Oh. And there arose a sharp disagreement. I love Luke because when Luke is saying that, I mean, he, he uses these words, a sharp disagreement. I mean, this is, this is a regular intense fellowship, is I think the word that has been used before. A robust discussion, a brouhaha going on. Um, and these are the two leaders of the church. It's a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took part with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. This disagreement becomes so sharp that they separate. I mean, so many Christians look at this event and we use it and we say, hey, if Paul and Barnabas can argue, I can argue with my brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ too. This is not an excuse to argue with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not what this event teaches us. Why? Because we're called to peace and unity with the brethren. This is what we're called to. But it does teach us a few things. I love when you want to know what something talks about, you can go straight to McGee. Because he's this old guy. He's going to tell you exactly what he thinks. This is what McGee says. It teaches me that these men were human. Paul and Barnabas, we put them on this huge pedestal. But this, this event right here teaches us that these two leaders in the church are human. They're not that different from me. They're not that different from us. They're human. That even the saints can disagree without being disagreeable. I mean, here's the thing. Both of these guys were pastors of the church in Antioch. This disagreement, if not handled correctly, could have divided this entire church. These two leaders having a disagreement could have split this entire church in Antioch, but it doesn't lead to that. They were both pastors. They disagreed, but they kept the unity of the spirit. And while disagreeing, they agree to do different things. Barnabas agrees and says, well, I'm going to take John Mark because I'm going to build that guy up. And Paul says, well, I've been called to go do this, this missionary route, building up these churches in Galatia, so I'm going to take Silas. And they agree to separate, and it's peaceable with them. John Stott points out a very valuable lesson. Paul and Barnabas agreed on the importance of missions. They agreed that missions, that these things needed to happen in their world. But they could not agree on the composition of the team. So often we agree on doctrinal issues, but our disagreements come from personal preferences. Disagreeing on the composition of the team, a personal preference, it's not necessary for any type of salvation. And they disagree. Here were two dedicated men who had just helped bring unity to the church, and yet they could not settle their own disagreements. Disturbing and painful as these conflicts are, they are often found in, a, in church history. And here's the lesson that we need to learn. God is able to overrule these disagreements and trials and accomplish his purpose. Paul Barnabas, both human. They were looking at the situation with different opinions and different classes. It caused conflict to happen. The amazing thing is that God overrules the conflict that they went through. And does something amazing in each one of these two groups that are now going out. Church tradition really tells us that Barnabas takes John Mark and goes to his home area, Cyprus. They go over there and they have this amazing ministry there. And their ministry is so amazing that the Lord raises up leaders on that island. And those leaders on that island then go and they send mission teams into northern Africa. That's what church history tells us, that they were so successful in building the church there that this church then becomes a mission-sending church and goes into northern Africa. Absolutely amazing. On top of that, John Mark proves beyond a shadow of a doubt to be a great help as Paul. You guys all know that Paul changes his opinion of John Mark. 2 Timothy 4.11 is Paul's last response about John Mark. And he says uh, to Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you. For he is very useful to me for ministry. Paul's opinion of John Mark has radically changed from I don't want to take that guy to get that guy and bring him. He's necessary to me for the ministry that God is doing. It's such an encouragement because this is the thing, man. John Mark first missionary journey, he dropped out. It's true. He dropped out. 
He quit. Who knows why he quit? There could be lots of different reasons, but he quit. He dropped out. But here's the thing. He never gave up. He might have dropped out, but he never gave up. He learned. He grew. He was filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God did a work in him, working in him so that the Spirit could use him to work through him to many different people. He became, I mean, he, he becomes useful to Paul. He listens to Peter and goes on to write the Gospel of Mark. This is an amazing man that God ends up using. Useful to the ministry is encouragement because... I know one thing, God's not done yet. Wherever you're at in life, maybe you're like that John Mark, and you've sat, sat there and you've given up on some things and you've quit on some things. God's not done yet. He hasn't finished with you yet. He hasn't finished with me yet. I have my faults. I have those blind spots that every single person has. God's not done with me yet. I failed. But God is still working in me. When those times when I fail, what do I do? I get up and I repent. I say, Lord, please forgive me. I want to move forward into that relationship with you. And he's still molding and shaping me, even now. Even as I get older, he's still working, molding me and shaping me into the man that he's created me to be. And he's able to take those things that happen in my life and turn them around and use them for good. God knows what I've done, but by His grace, that's not who I am. I am a son of the Most High God. If you can hear that in your own life, you're a son, you're a daughter of the Most High God. Those things that we've done, those trials, those whatever it is, you need to give it to God. You need to say, Lord, would you forgive me for those times where I've messed up? I know the enemy wants to give me that label of failure. Like you tried to give John Mark the label of failure. That maybe, I don't know who's giving you in your life is giving you these labels, but that's not who you are. It might have been what you've done, but it's what you've done, but it's not who you are. Romans 8.28 is such an encouragement from all of us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. I didn't know how my daughter's sickness and my relationship with my wife back in the early days was ever going to turn out for any good, right? You look at these things, you're like, how in the world is this situation going to turn out for good? But that's just the amazing thing for God. I can't see it, but God knows. And he takes that situation and he turned it around. And he turned it around and he used it for, for my good and for his glory. This was true back in the time, back in the book of Acts. It's true. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I've seen it true in my own life. And I know if you think honestly about it, that you've seen it happen in your own life as well. It's true for each and every one of us that God turns things around and he works them for good. And I know it's not just true for each one of us, but it's also true for the church. That God turns around and uses things that can happen that are tough, but he turns around and uses it for his glory. God took this disagreement between these two men. He used Barnabas and John Mark to do something amazing. He also is going to use Paul and Silas to do something absolutely amazing. We don't follow Barnabas and John Mark. We don't get to follow their story, although I'd like to like see that story sometime, but we're going to follow Paul and Silas. We're going to follow these men as they, they've they been sent out. We saw that in in verse 40 and 41, they've been sent out by the church. They're making their way into Galatia. And so what happens? Paul, chapter 16, verse 1. Paul came also to Derb and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And here's Timothy. He's a young man. He came to the Lord most likely during the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. He had come to the Lord, and now it says something very specific of this young man. He is a disciple. He's seen the example set by the leadership that Paul and Barnabas had put over the church. And he starts to be raised up to start following in the footsteps of that leadership. And man, he's, what does it say? He becomes a disciple. He followed him. He becomes, he starts to get this reputation. There's a reputation of, uh, around this young man that people are speaking of him, saying, man, this guy is great. He's doing amazing things for God. God has done an amazing work in his life. Paul knows. Paul Silas, they know John Mark isn't here. We need a young guy. 
I mean, we need the Daniel to come and help us with all the work of the ministry because there's a lot of work in the ministry. And so they say, they start praying about it. They say, well, hey, this Timothy guy looks great. Let's bring this guy with us. But there's a problem that's denoted there. His mom was a Jew and his dad was a Greek. He was part Jewish. And so it's a problem in this time because so what is Paul going to do? Verse 3, it tells us Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. They talk about, they pray about him, they say, we want this guy to accompany us. He's a great, a great guy. We want him to accompany us. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. You might be thinking, okay, time out right here. We need to take a time out because didn't, just a chapter ago, didn't Paul and Barnabas go before the church in Jerusalem, the leadership, and just talk about and argue against circumcision? Didn't they just do that? So isn't there a huge difference here? Is he not following his own advice by circumcising young Timothy? I'm going to tell you right now, there's a massive difference between what Paul argued about in Jerusalem and what Paul does here. Paul in Jerusalem, what was he, the, what was he saying? He was saying that there is nothing that needs to be added to the cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Not the works of the law, not circumcision. Nothing needs to be added to Christ. Christ did everything for us on the cross. Nothing needs to be added to that. That's what he argued here. He, I'll go back one more thing. They wrote the letter. And in that letter, you remember they talked about, hey, don't eat, don't eat the meat, don't, eat the, don't, eat, don't do that stuff. Why did they talk about that? They said, we want you to, to do that because those things are offensive to your Jewish brothers. You will be an ineffective witness if you start doing these things amongst your, gen or amongst your Jewish brothers who you want to lead to the Lord. You'll be ineffective if you start doing this kind of stuff. And so we see that there needs to be this idea of not stumbling my brother. Not stumbling my sister in the things that I do. And so Paul, why does he circumcise Timothy? Well, it was, you notice it says right there, because of the Jews. The Jews know this is a Jewish man. And Paul says, I want Timothy to have an amazing, effective ministry amongst the Jewish people that we're going to be ministering with. The Jewish people would find it highly offensive if Paul wasn't circumcised. They wouldn't hear a word that he said because of that one thing. And so Paul says, because I want you to have an effective ministry. I know it's not vital to salvation, but I want you to reach every single person that you can reach. And so we're going to circumcise you so that when you go speak to these Jews, they're going to hear what you have to say about Jesus Christ. It wasn't about Timothy's salvation. It was about effective ministry to people. Paul explains his thinking very clearly in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. And I'm just going to read you verse 22 because that's what he uses to sum up. He says this. Paul says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I'm going to do things in order to save people. He wants Timothy, I want you to have an effective ministry. We're going to circumcise you. Because if we do, eternity is at stake. Eternity, eternal destinies are at stake. And if by circumcising you, one Jew will believe. Because you're not offensive to that one Jew. It's going to be worth it. Because now one person is in heaven because you got circumcised. But if we're going to see that Timothy is going to have a much greater impact than one person. The reality is the same for us. We need to do things to reach the communities and the people, the areas that we live. I'm not, we can't, dude, we can't sin when we reach out to people. I want to make that very clear. I'm not saying, you know, go to a bar and start drinking just to reach people in bars that are drinking. That's not an effective use of what Paul is talking about here. But I have neighbors that ride motorcycles. What do I do? How do I talk to those neighbors that ride motorcycles? Well, it just so happens that I know a thing or two about riding motorcycles. And so I talk to them about riding motorcycles in order to talk to them about Jesus Christ. Because I know that they're going to hear me if I start talking about motorcycles. They're going to sit and listen for a little while. So I'll talk about motorcycles. I'll use something in the world to effectively minister to that one person who needs to hear about Jesus. This is what Paul is talking about. He's saying, don't be offensive to your brothers. Don't, don't be causing them to stumble. Be effective in your ministry to others. Do everything that you can to tell someone, one person, about Jesus. Everything that you can. 
Don't sin to do it, but do everything that you can to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Eternal destinies are at stake. And so he sits here and he circumcises Timothy. And Timothy joins this team, becomes a partner in the work. And what does it say in verse 4? And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. This letter is delivered. This letter that had been brought to Antioch is now delivered out to these places where Paul had gone before on this first missionary journey. The churches, they're being strengthened. The gospel is being preached. People are responding to the gospel. We've talked about this for, for as long as I can remember that when the gospel is preached, people respond. It's either a no or a yes. There's no other response that they can have. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, people respond. And that's what we see. People here, they're responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is doing something amazing, strengthening and building up these churches. Paul and his team are now like, okay, we visited these places. Where next? And they start to make some plans. We want to go to the big cities. We want to minister for God in the big cities. Asia's right here. Let's go minister for, to God in Asia. Let's go do some things for the Lord. See what doors the Lord is going to open up. And so notice what God does. Verse 6. And they went through the region of Nigeria and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That door to, to go down into Asia, down south into Asia, has been closed to them. There's some great cities down there that they want to preach. Don't those people need Jesus? Let's go down there and preach Jesus. The Lord closes the door. Okay. So, we're prevented from going south. We've come from the east. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. They start to go north. And somehow the Spirit of the Lord stops them from going north. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, he immediately, uh, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I love the little maps. Where do they start? You guys see where, oh, I went too far. You guys see where they started? Right here. Antioch, this is where this journey started. They've gone up. They've gone, they've gone, they've gone over here. They pick up Timothy. They continue to speak through all the churches. And then now, look at Asia. Ephesus is down there. Oh, man, there's these huge cities. The Lord says, no, you can't go south. You can't go south into Asia. Okay, well, they go up by Mysia, and they're like, look at what's up. Look at what's north. Bithynia is up north, but what's there? The Black Sea. There was huge, huge cities around this Black Sea. Man, all those people up there need Jesus. Yes, they need Jesus. But the Lord prevents them from going north. And so they're like, okay, well, we've come from the east. We can't go south. We can't go north. And so they end up, they end up over here. Right on the Aegean Sea. Troas. They're at the edge of Asia now. What are we going to do? We've gone as far as we can go without taking a boat anywhere. I love showing the maps. It gives you an idea. This is modern-day Turkey that they've gone through here preaching the gospel. Things are radically happening for Jesus. And so they come and here in Troas, right here in this port city, Paul has a vision. A man of Macedonia is calling to him. Come. Come and help. You know, he says, help us. And they conclude that by help, the only help that they're going to bring is the help of Jesus Christ. Because there's eternal lives at stake. And so they see this cry of help as an open door and they say, well, we're going over to the biggest city that we know, which is Philippi. If you notice throughout this whole thing, you've seen the words, you know, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, they, 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 them, they, it's all, it's all them. But then in verse 10, you see it changes. It becomes we. So obviously Dr. Luke has met them in Troas. And he's now joined this team. He says, we have now made this decision to go together. Dr. Luke is with them. And most people do believe that Dr. Luke's hometown is Philippi. And they say, well, let's go to my hometown. You saw this man in Macedonia calling. I'm here with you guys now. I know this city. Let's go over to Philippi and see what the Lord is going to do. And so the cry for help is there. And so verse 11, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samphrace, 
and following day to Neapolis on the, another coastal city and from there to Philippi, 10 mile hike inland, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. They arrived in Philippi, Roman colony. What does that mean? It means the Roman governor for the areas in the city. It means many veterans from the Roman war have settled in this place. This place has Roman customs and I mean, it's, it's a little Rome, a Rome away from Rome, a great leading city of the region. It's a large city. We're going to quickly see that there's not very many believers or people even seeking the Lord in this city. Why? I'm going to tell you. It takes 10 men, 10. It takes 10 men back in those days to start a Jewish synagogue. That's how many people it takes to start a Jewish synagogue. If there's not 10 men earnestly seeking the Lord in a city, a Jewish synagogue cannot be started. And so what will happen is there'll be a place of prayer outside of the city where people will come and they'll pray for God to do something. And so we, what, what happens? Verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Not even 10 men in this city that are seeking the Lord. There's not even a synagogue because Paul would have gone. That's his, that's his, that's what he does. He goes to the synagogue first. The city is so lost that there's not even a synagogue in the city. But there's some women having a prayer meeting at the river on the Sabbath day. Some women have been seeking the Lord. They're meeting to pray. There's a, there's a small group of ladies out by the river. I want you to notice there's one thing I really want you to notice in this event. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Why were these women coming to the river? They were coming to have a prayer meeting. They were praying, Lord, would you reveal yourself to us? Would you show us what we need to do? Lord, would you do something in our lives? There's, we're living in this godless city. Nobody is seeking after you. There's just us few women here meeting by the river. Lord, would you do something? Would you do something in this state that we're in? Would you do something in our country? Would you do something in our leadership? Would you do something here, Lord? Something needs to happen. Have you seen the place where we live? Have you seen the things that happens in the city, Lord? And they meet their faithful. They have committed. I want to, they have committed to come together to pray, to seek the will of God. These women, they don't even know about Jesus yet. All they know is the God of the Old Testament. And they come together and they pray, Lord, would you do something? We want more, so we're going to pray. It doesn't matter the size of the group. The Lord hears our prayers and he's going to answer them in his timing and in his way. I mean, this, as I was studying this this week, it was such a big encouragement to me. If the Lord is going to hear this small group of women who are praying and send, he sends the Apostle Paul. This is this little group that's praying. He sends the Apostle Paul to these guys. A vision in Troas. Come to Macedonia. Luke is there saying, well, that's my hometown. Let's go over to Philippi. No matter the size of the group, the Lord hears our prayers. He sends Paul and his team to minister to them. If the Lord is going to hear the prayers of these women, the Lord's going to hear my prayer. If the Lord's going to hear the prayer of these women, the Lord hears your prayer. The Lord's ear is open to the prayers of his saints. And, I mean, he's, going to, he's not going to answer them in my, my way. The way that I think he should answer them. Hey, Lord, do my will here on earth. This is not what it says that we should be praying for. My will to be done. Uh, no. I'm to pray for the Lord's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I want to encourage you that God's going to answer prayer in his way, in his timing. I want to encourage you one thing. Pray as men and women of God individually pray. Commit to prayer. And then as you yourself commit to prayer, pray with those who are closest to you. Pray with your spouse. For me, it was pray with my wife. I do. Lorena does a much better job at this than me. When I go to sleep, I'm going to tell you right now, Lorena knows. I, my head hits a pillow and I'm asleep. That's just, that's just how it is. As soon as I like lie down, I am, I'm, I've worked so hard in the day, I just, I don't spend any time waiting to go to sleep. I'm not like, I'm going to wait to go to sleep. No, I'm going to sleep. I'm tired. I just fall asleep. Lorena cannot do that. And so she'll like, she, 
comes to bed later and she's doing it. But then Lorena is very good. Before she goes to sleep, she prays. And every time she prays, I wake up. And what do you think my attitude is like when I wake up as Lorena's praying for me? I'm going to tell you it's not good. And so my prayers usually for my wife at night are terrible prayers. Lord, thank you for my wife. Thank you for blah, blah, blah. Go to sleep. And her prayers at night are just these flowery, amazing prayers to God. I'm so stoked. I'm so encouraged hearing him. And then I was like, oh, Lord, I'm so tired. Why is this happening? I need to do a better job. I need to do that better job of praying for my spouse. I need to have that prayer life myself so that when I'm praying, so that when Marina's praying for me, I'm praying for her. Because we're a unit. We're one. God has made us one flesh. And then as we're one flesh, he's blessed us with a quiver of arrows that we need to be praying for. And, and that's another area. Man, I can do a better job in that of praying for with my family and for my family. And as I'm starting to pray in this sphere that God has put me in, if I'm faithful with that, I need to then go out and say, well, I need to also be praying for a bunch of other stuff. There's the church, my church family. I need to be praying for and with my church family. Come out if the Lord calls you on Thursday nights. Pray with your church family and pray for your church family. I'm sure, I mean, we just listen, like four different people, families that are going through very difficult times. Pray for them. Come stand alongside of them as they're going through these difficulties. Pray for the church. Pray for your neighbors. How many of you have neighbors? Every one of you has neighbors. You live in Hawaii. There's no room on the island. Everyone has neighbors. I have a bunch of neighbors because we live in a townhouse. There's a ton of neighbors. Pray for your neighbors. God wants to do something in your neighbors' lives. And not only your neighbors, pray for this community, Milani. We live in an amazing community. It's an amazing community we live in. We had the trunk or treat just when it was the 31st. It was an amazing event. Josh Valoria's dad is absolutely stunning. I mean, that guy. I love that magic. And he's just sharing the gospel with all those people that were there. It just blew my mind. Pray that those seeds would be sown in this community. Pray for our veterans, man. We have amazing military that stands for our freedoms. Pray for those who are sacrificing so that we can be here today. There are people around the globe right now sacrificing so that we can be here now. Pray for our service members. Pray for our country, man. Our country, if you don't watch, and I don't get the newspaper, and I hardly look at the news anymore because I just get so fed up. But every time I look at the news, our country is fractured, man. It's absolutely chaos. I just, I don't understand how it's gotten this far. Pray that the, the only way our country will be healed is Jesus Christ. No one else is going to save and heal our country. It's only through Jesus Christ. Pray for our country. And as you pray for our country, pray for our leaders. We have state elected officials. We need to pray for our state elected officials. We have federal elected officials. We need to pray for those elected officials. That God would do something in their lives. That he would lead our leaders who are leading our country to do what's right. I mean, we need to pray. We need to be, if God is going to answer a group of women praying in a godless country, in a godless city, for God to do something amazing. And God answers that prayer by sending the great apostle Paul and his missionary team. God knows how to answer prayer. I don't know how he's going to do it, but God will answer prayer. Pray for these things that God puts on your heart. And where does it start? It starts with your prayer life. If your prayer life isn't right, you're not going to pray with your spouse. If you're not going to pray with your spouse, you're not praying for your kids. If you're not praying for your kids, you're not praying for your grandkids. If you're not praying for your family, there's no way you're praying for your neighbors. If you're not praying for your neighbors, there's no way you're going to pray for our veterans. If you're not praying for our servicemen, there's no way you're praying for our country. And if you're not praying for our country, you're not praying for our leaders. We need to pray. And that's how it begins. This is what God was showing me. 1 John 5. 14 through 15 says this, this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the request that we have asked of him. Commit. Like these women. This is what I want to tell them this Sunday. Commit. Just one word, commit to prayer. That's what these women did. They said, we're going to commit to praying for God's will. 
We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know how it's going to happen, but we're going to commit to do it. And God answers prayer. And notice how it happens. Two more verses. Verse 14 says, one, they come and they speak. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. One woman in this group, a worshiper of God, she knew about the God of the Old Testament. She was worshiping, seeking, believing that God was going to do something and answer her prayers. And here comes Paul and Paul preaches Jesus Christ to her. And she hears it and she changes from being a mere worshiper and seeking God to believing and following Jesus Christ. God does an amazing work in her heart in a moment. He opens her heart to understand the things that Paul is speaking about. And man, Paul writes about this experience. He says in Romans 10, verse 13 through 15, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You go back to chapter 15, the very end, this team was sent out. They were sent out to preach the good news. And here they are in a godless city, just amongst a couple of women who were sitting there seeing what the Lord would do. And they preach the good news. And this is the same for all of us. God calls us. What does he call us? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he calls you, me, an ambassador of Jesus Christ. As if Christ were what? Pleading through you, be reconciled to God. God is pleading through you to the people that he's put you in contact with, be reconciled to God. We're called to be ambassadors to a lost and hurting world. The last time I looked, the world is lost and hurting. There are so many people who are hurting. And we're to do one thing. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Because God knew our condition. He knew that the world was hurting. It's not a surprise to God that the world is hurting. He's not waking up today and being like, oh my goodness, the world is hurting. What happened? No, he's not surprised. He knows the world is hurting. And so what does he do? He sent Jesus. God came and took on humanity that he lived. He was tempted and yet without sin. He died for us on the cross so that we could have a relationship with God. Me, you, the world, whosoever believes can have a relationship with God. And he rose again three days later proving that every single thing that he said is absolutely true. And that we have hope for the future that one day, and I was just talking with Becky this morning, one day Jesus is coming soon. And it's sooner today than it was yesterday and last week. And if you haven't turned to him, I mean, that was the time. You must turn to God. And if you have turned to God, then you must be a man or a woman of prayer that's looking for those areas to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Do business with God. Encourage others to do business with God. If you need help, come talk to me, Pastor Clay, any of the elders. We'd love to talk and encourage you guys in this. And as people respond to God, what do they respond? They respond and they become part of the local church, except here in Philippi, there's a problem. There is no local church. What happens? Verse 15, and this is what we'll end with today. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The church starts in the first conference hall. She invites them to come, and they go. And here, in this great city of Philippi, a church starts in a woman's home that just simply said, I'm going to believe in Jesus, I'm going to follow him. Reminds me of back in 1990, how this church started, Calvary Chapel of Central Wahoo, we started in my parents' house with the Bible study. With some people from North Shore Christian Fellowship saying, God is doing something in Milibani, and we want to be part of it, we want to see what the Lord is doing. And so Pastor Rick started having a Bible study up in my parents' house, and I was just a little tiny, Becky was reminding me, I was three feet tall, little kid running around, being a little rambunctious rebel, that was me, running, you know, she remembers me from back then. Pastor Rick, Pastor Clay took over that study when the church, you know, when he came and the church had been going. He took this small group of people, who walked in obedience. They might not have seen the end result. They might not have understood what God was doing, but he took, I want you to see this, he took a small group of people the size that met in a living room in someone's home. 28 years later, you can fast forward that time. Has there been difficulty? Sure. 
There's been difficulties. Has there been trials? Yeah. But he's taken that group of people that started meeting. He took that small group and united them together. 28 years later, that group of people has radically changed this community and radically changed the world. The things that have been done in this community where people have come to know the Lord blow my mind. The things that God has done through this group to reach out Indonesia. Things that God has done in this church to reach out to Mexico. Things that God has done in this church seven years now in Nepal. Blows my mind that this church, this group, look around. This group, because of Jesus Christ, is impacting the world. You're part of what God is doing, not just here in the community, but across the world. And that, how does God do that? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm a part of it. And I'm so stoked to be a part of it. And so where does that leave us this morning? I want to just remind you, God has a plan. God has a plan. There's going to be setbacks. And maybe you're part of one of those setbacks in your life right now. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be closed doors in our lives. I've seen them. I've come across them in my own life. Paul and his team came across those things. They were prevented from going south. They are prevented from going north to do the things that they wanted to do. They might not have understood in that moment what God was doing, but they were obedient. They went to Troas, the only place for them to go. They heard the call. They went over to Philippi, and there was one person that responds. And out of that one person, out of this, they enter in, what they've done, what you've seen today is they've entered into Europe. And a lot of our ancestors, if you're anything like me, a lot of us have ancestry leading from Europe. And that's where my ancestors were. They were up north in the frozen tundras of Norway at that point, doing, worshiping Thor and doing terrible things to people. That was my ancestors. But God started doing something in this chapter right here. My ancestors were going to get saved because what did they did right here in chapter 16. They might not have seen it, but they were obedient. And I want to encourage you, the same is true for you. There's a time, maybe you don't understand what God is doing. He might be closing doors, you can't figure out why. The only question I think that matters in this moment is, am I going to obey what God calls me to do? Am I going to be faithful to his calling on my way? I want to tell you that you can look at me and you think, oh, Eli, he's always obedient. Eli is not always obedient. I'm a sinner, man. I mess up. I miss the mark. But I want to tell you, when I do fail, I repent. And I pray and I say, Lord, would you change me? Would you make me more like you? Because I want to be effective in the work this morning. I want to be effective for God in the things that I do. And so the question for me is, are you where you're sitting this morning? As the worship team comes up, we're going to sing a last song together. Are you obedient in the small things? Are you obedient in those little areas? If it's just one person, are you obedient with that one person? Are you obedient in the small things? Because if you're obedient in the small things, there's going to be a day that you're going to rejoice because you're going to see the big thing that the Lord was doing in that small thing. And for me, those days are always exciting. Father, I just trust, Lord, that you're going to work in our lives this week. Lord, I trust that you spoke to our hearts this morning, that we would be obedient in those things that you call us to. Lord, would you work in us to help us as men and women to commit ourselves to you, to commit ourselves to prayer, to commit ourselves to the work that you're doing in our lives. Lord, would you make us useful to the ministry, Lord, reaching out to our family and our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, this community, and even across the world. Lord, continue the amazing work that you're doing. We want to stay yoked with you, following you, so God, help us not to leave this place the same, but to leave this place changed. And we commit ourselves as individuals and we commit ourselves as a church to you. Lord, do your will in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys stand together? We'll sing this last song. Love you guys.